ሰላም እንዴትናችሁ ዛሬ ስለ ፈጣን ሙልቲፕሊኬሽን ነው ምን ማለው እሺ All right, I am just kidding. Uh, what we're going to learn about today is fast multiplication. So if you're watching this channel, you're probably watching for software engineering prep. And we do a lot of algorithm stuff, but I'm going to be honest, this video and this topic is not going to be useful for you at all. This video, if you're watching for that purpose, is probably just going to be for entertainment slash intrigue purposes. Um, otherwise, this is completely useless for you and I'm just doing it because it's pretty famous and it matters in algorithms. So what we're going to look at is how do we multiply numbers? Okay, so give me two numbers. Give me y and x. So I have those numbers. How, how do we multiply them? So we're going all the way back to what we learned when we were kids. And the way we learned to multiply when we were kids was not the fastest way. And so how would we do this? So let's do this together. So we would grab one digit from the bottom number and then we'd multiply it by all the digits in the top number. We'd grab the next one, all of the ones in the top, grab the next one, all of the ones in the top, grab the next one, all of the ones in the top. And I forgot to say N, N, remember we always define N, N is supposed to be the length of each of the numbers. So the numbers don't have to be the same length, but we just will con consider the special case where they're the same length. And we're going to have each number be length N. And here N is four. I want you to remember that. We're gonna need that later. So how many multiplications just happened? N is four, we just did one multiplication against four, another multiplication against four, another against four, and another against four. So we just did 16 multiplications. How many multiplications is that? Well, that's n squared. That's four squared multiplications. So why is this algorithm bad? Well, we're bounded to n squared. Our big O bound on this is n squared. Can we do better? That is the question we always ask and they stereotypically ask us in our interviews. And okay, let's think, let's think like computer scientists. How do we think about doing better? So let's think about our asymptotic bounds. I talk about asymptotic stuff all the time. Let's put them right there. So, okay, that is our palette to choose from. And uh, I need to choose. Let me think about what I wanna do. So I'm sitting at n squared right now. And what is the best that I can do? Well, I can do another bound that's something like n to the 1.8 or something like that, or I can go down to n log n, or we can be really aggressive. Let's say we could do linear time. Well, the thing is linear time seems a little too aggressive. So I think the most optimal approach might be between n log n and n squared, but we'll see, we'll see how we do that. So this brings me to my next point or the next topic. How do we speed this up? How do we increase the speed of our multiplication? Because this is fast multiplication after all. It's faster than our standard algorithm. So we saw that we did n squared multiplications with the grade school algorithm. So why don't we try to do something different? And now let's present our example again and look at it a different way. Okay, so let's bring back our example and n equals four. I'm gonna put that up there. This is very, very important. Remember that n equals four. So the, the approach that we could take is we could do a divide and conquer approach. So again, this is, this is like a famous algorithm and this is not something, this is not like an interview question. Just, just stay with me and we'll, we'll see how this improves uh, the time. So we have two numbers. Call this guy x, call the top guy y, and what we need to do is we need to chop each in half. We need to chop each into an A, a B, a C, and a D. And okay, I said that, let's put those off to the side and let's keep note of them. And we have an A, B, C, and D. A and B is a part of X, C and D is a part of Y. So okay, we have split those sections. So what I can declare is I need to reshape what I declare X and Y as. And what we can say is Y is 10 to the N over two times C plus D. And here's why. So I want you to look at Y. Let me put it right there for you. And let me do a little splitting. Let me split it apart. If I take the sum of these two numbers, what do I get? I get my original Y, right? I get my original Y. So what we need to think about is where did that original equation come from? 
Well, all I did was I took into account how much I how much my um, C term is shifted over from the side. It's shifted by two places. Two is a familiar number to me. Remember n is four. So what the 10 means, all the 10 means, if you do 10 to the power of something, times something, we are shifting in a number over by that much. If I do one times 10, I'm shifting the one over. If I do one times 100, I'm shifting the one over two places. So does that make sense? All we're doing is decomposing the numbers. We're not changing them at all. So let's go back to our example and let's look at y. And we said it's 10 times n over two. We need to shift it n over two places over. And now we multiply that by the second number, c, because we need to do that so we stay you know, the same as our example, plus the first part, which is D. So that's Y, and then X follows the same pattern. We do 10 to the N over two times A plus B. So I really want you to understand what just happened because this is something we're gonna build off of later. So we have these numbers sitting right here. And what we need to do is we need to multiply them together. So why don't we just do a simple multiplication? So let's take our X and Y and let's move them into one line. Let's do that right now. And let's do FOIL. We know how to multiply uh, poly polynomial quantities together or binomial quantities. So let's do a multiplication. Let's multiply the first term and first term. We get that. Multiply the first term by that second term. We get that. Multiply the second term by the first term. We get that. And we multiply the last term by the last term. We get that. And then once we do a little simplification, we finally get that equation. So now we have what that equation says. It says 10 to the N times AC plus 10 to the N over two times AD plus BC plus BD equals our original X times Y. So what we have here is an equation to decompose our original subproblem. Our original subproblem was x times y. And now what we've done is we've decomposed the original subproblem into another subproblem with four multiplications. We have a times c, we have a times d, we have b times c, we have b times d. And now what we need to do is we need to look at these multiplications and analyze how much time we saved ourselves. And again, this is going to be recursively going downwards with our base case being what is called an atomic multiplication. An atomic multiplication is signified by the mu or mu sign. And what it is, is it is the time it takes for a fundamental multiplication operation to happen. And that instead of just saying one, we use that special sign to mean that because it would depend on the system you're on and stuff like that, the hardware. Okay, so if you're still following me, we have this new formula. That is our new formula for calculating the value of two and digit numbers multiplied together. So what is the length of A? The length of A is n over two. The length of C is n over two. The length of D is n over two. The length of B is n over two. And remember, n is our original quantity, n was four. And this is the first level of our recursion where we split downwards. And so now something we need to establish is if I am multiplying an n over two number by an n over two number, what is the length of the result? Well, the length of the result is going to be a length n number. So if I have a length n over two a number and I have a length n over two c number, if I multiply those together, I'm going to get a length n number. Okay, so remember we have our four multiplications right there. a times c, a times d, b times c, and b times d. So these each are multiplications and that's our original equation. So what we need to do is we need to realize the length of each of these multiplications because now we need to analyze how many additions happened. So what we need to do is we need to look at how much time it takes to do AD plus BC. How many additions happen? So A times D, it's going to give us a length and number. B times C, it's going to give us a length and number. Why? 
Remember, A is n over two, B is n over two, C is n over two, D is n over two. Those are the numbers we extracted by chopping our original n length number in half. So the result of A times D is going to be length n, which will be four at the top level, and the result of B times C will be length four, which will be at the top level as well. If we're adding two length n numbers, how many additions are we doing? We're going to be doing and additions, but we use a special sign. We use a alpha sign to represent atomic additions, the smallest additions we can do. And remember this, we have our atomic multiplications, which is represented by the mu, uh, mu, I'm saying that wrong, and the atomic additions, which are represented by the alpha. So remember, we're just trying to track our multiplications and additions we're doing, and we're gonna see why. So, okay, back to analyzing this four multiplication. Remember, one, two, three, four recursive multiplications are going to happen to express the original x times y. That guy in the middle is going to give us alpha n additions. Okay, alpha n additions, that makes sense. Because remember, if we're adding a length n and a length n number, the amount of additions we're gonna do is n times the time it takes for an addition, or the um, cost of an atomic addition. So what we need to see is, okay, middle part alpha n, thank you. And now, do we add the guys on the tail end? And we do not, and here's the reason why. If we're multiplying something by 10 to the n, and it is length n, we are shifting a length n number over by n places. So that's gonna leave n zeros. So here's an, uh, uh, here's an animation. So if I had one, two, three, four, and I multiply it by 10 to the four, I'm going to have one, two, three, four times four zeros. If I add that number to a number of length four, do you see what I did right there? Why would I do alpha additions? Why would I do any additions there when I see a pattern? What I can do is I can just concatenate these guys concatenate the results together, and that leaves me with another quantity. Okay, so now we're playing with two added numbers. We're playing with our result from AD plus BC, which took alpha n time, and we're playing with our result 10 to the n AC plus BD, which was the result of a concatenation. So, okay, we have two numbers. One of them is length what? One of them is length 2n and one of them is length n. So how many additions are we going to do? We're going to be doing another alpha n additions to combine these quantities. So think about this. The result from a times c is length n. We pushed it over by four numbers. So now it's length 2n. It went from length four to length eight. And the result from bd is length n. And remember we concatenated them. And now we need to think, well, the result from ADBC is going to be a length of n, right? And then if we're adding a number length 2n to a number of length n, the only places that will require addition will be n places. So that's alpha n additions. So total, this algorithm is going to be performing um, two alpha n additions at each level of our recursion, at each level. So this brings me to, my, I now have an ability to draw a recurrence. I can draw a recurrence relation to express how this function, how this recursion is going to do work recursively. So let's look at that recurrence right now. So all a recurrence is, is an expression of the amount of work done in a recursive relationship. And in something that you know, recurs and does work over and over. So what we need to see is how many times are we going to split? So what we're going to do is we're gonna get two numbers of length n. And what we're going to do is we're going to split them in half. We're going to split each number in half, yielding four n over two numbers. So what we're going to be doing is, we're going to be doing four multiplications. Remember back to our equation. There are one, two, three, four multiplications. So to solve my current multiplication, I'm going to have to do four more multiplications, and then four more until I reach a base case when I have two single digit numbers, and then that's just an atomic multiplication. So what we need to do is we need to see, how do I call this function? So I'm going to call this function 
four times. I'm going to call it four times. And what is the size of the input to each of those functions? Well, bring, bring my numbers back. I had two length n numbers. I chopped them in half. I have four length n over two numbers. And if I'm doing a multiplication or if I'm doing a call, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be passing in two length n over two numbers. I'm going to be passing numbers the size of n over two. So if I make another call, what I'm going to be passing in is numbers the size of n over two. So the size of the input to the recursive call is n over two. Because remember, both of the numbers being passed to a multiplication function will be length n. That's our original quantity. But when we make a recursive call, it's from the chopped numbers. And the chopped numbers are length n over 2. And if I pass two chopped numbers, they'll both be length n over 2. So that's that right there. And how much work is done during like inside our call when we're actually calculating the quantities and doing our additions once we get multiplication values back, once we bought them out to our base case. The amount of additions we just established is 2 alpha n. So this is it. This is the recurrence. So we see that we have 4. The size of the next call for a multiplication going downward will be n over 2. The length of the two numbers, x and y, we pass in our next call will be length n over 2. And then what do we add that to? We add that to 2 alpha n. That is the work that we're going to be doing to combine all our results once all our callers come back to us. And that is going to be the work done on this call. And so this is going to be a recursive expression of the total work we're going to do. And what we need to look at is a tree to make this really obvious. So why don't we do that right now? Okay, so we start with n. And what did I say? If I'm multiplying two n length numbers, I'm going to make four multiplication calls. Each of the calls will get n over two size x and y's. So, okay, that's fair. So I want four forks, each a size of n over two. Okay, so we just forked, and now each of those subproblems have a size of n over two. And they're going to fork again. And what is the size of the subproblem they fork uh, to? What is that going to be? Well, it's gonna be half of n over two, which is n over four. So each of these guys will have four forks, and the subproblem will become n over four in size. Okay, so now you see our recursive tree slowly going downwards. And what I want you to now see is how many subproblems are each at each level. So we see there's one subproblem at the top level. There are four subproblems at the next level. And then there's 16 subproblems at the next level. And now how much work is done in each level? Remember in the first level we said it's going to be 2 alpha n. The size of the subproblems we get at this level is n. And then what we see is we are going to do how much work in the next level? 4 times what? Not 2 alpha n, the size of the subproblem is now n over 2. So we're going to have 2 alpha n over 2. Okay, so what is the size for the next level? Well, we're going to do 2 alpha what? Size of the subproblem is n over 4. 2 alpha n over 4, because that's the size of the input. The, the amount of additions are contingent on the size of the input. So we're going to do 2 alpha n over 4. Okay, so how do I generalize this? So the way that I generalize this is, don't you see how 4 to the 0 is 1, 4 to the 1 is 4, 4 to the 2 is 16? So let's say 4 to the i, 4 to the i times what? We're trying to generalize the work done at every level. And what we can see is the 2 alpha is going to stay the same because all that changes is the n. And what do we see? So at the first level, we have n over 1. At the second level, we have n over 2. At the third level, we have n over 4. So we see a pattern. Well, actually, level 0, 1, and 2. So 2 to the 0 is 1. 2 to the 1 is 2. 2 to the 2 is 4. So we see that we can express it as 2 to the power of something, 2 to the i, 2 to the level we're on. So it becomes n over 2 to the i. Okay, and then this should not be surprising. We've already done recurrence relations in recur recursion trees. In my merge sort video, this, should, this shouldn't be new to us. We know how to analyze a recursive tree and extract a generalization of the work done at every level. And that's a generalization of the work we do at every level. But there's one more thing we need to take into account. We need to take into account atomic multiplications done at our base cases. So how many levels are gonna be in this tree? 
So the amount of levels in this tree are going to be log n levels. And again, if you're not sound with logarithms, I have videos on logarithms that I have other videos that talk about it. The reason we have log base two levels in this tree is because we're cutting our input size in half at every level. And we can only cut our input size in half to get to a base case of ones a certain amount of times. And a logarithm expresses that. A logarithm tells us how many times we can chop in half. And we're chopping our input size in half every level. So a logarithm will give us the height of this tree. And we need that value because we need to find how many atomic multiplications happen at the bottom level. The amount of multi atomic multiplications is signified, or the time for atomic multiplication, the um, cost is signified by the mu or mu sign. And what we're gonna do is it's gonna look like this. So what we see here is the mu times four to the log n. Four to the what? The amount of levels gives us the amount of ones in this final level. Why does it do that? Remember, our generalization was four to the level number to give us the amount of nodes. Level zero, four to the zero is one. How many nodes do you see? You see one node. Level one, which is this level, four to the one is four. How many nodes do you see? Four nodes. Four to the two, four to the two, you see 16 nodes. Four to the log n, the amount of levels, will give us the amount of nodes in the last level. And that's how logarithms help us. So four to the log n gives us the amount of base cases, and each base case will take mu cost. It'll have a time or a cost of mu, or mu, I, keep, I, I can't say it, I don't know how it's pronounced. Yeah, that is multiplications, atomic multiplications, and those are going to be how we sum our atomic additions. And here's what we can do. We can take this tree and we can derive a summation. It's gonna look like this. So finally we get a summation. We go from this first level, level zero, all the way to the second to last level. We sum up the work we did, sum up the additions. We're not doing anything new, nothing new is happening. We're just using that generalization we had before and we're using it right there. And then what we add that to is what we deduced at the leaf level. The final level is where our base cases happen, our atomic multiplications. Because we don't keep going if we have two single digit numbers. We just have an answer. Because that's a, that is the finite, the smallest, the smallest multiplication that can happen. It's an atomic multiplication. So we have mu times four to the log n. Four to the log n is the number of base cases, the number of leaf nodes times the cost of the atomic multiplication. So this is the work that we do and we can do simplification. I probably do it wrong. So I'm just gonna pull from my notes. So if you actually solve this and throw the summation in some calculator, what you're going to find is we're going to be doing n squared multiplications. And the surprising thing is, although we did this divide and conquer approach, we would think that this would do better, but it actually doesn't. And on the asymptotic end, it does not do any better than our multiplication with the grade school algorithm. And that's how many additions we do, but we're more concerned about the multiplications because they weigh us down a lot. So what we see here is we did not improve. We did not do better asymptotically, and this does not help us. So we need to go back to the drawing board, literally, and we need to reassess our original equation that we came up with and see how we can fix things. All right, so we're back to the drawing board and let's pull back up our equation we had. So that is our equation to express x times y. We're doing four additions right there, 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 and there. And that is not good. That did not help us improve on our asymptotic bound for multiplications. So we need to see the culprit and the culprit sits right there. That, those two terms in the middle are multiplications that we do not need to do. And here's the reason why. What we can actually do is we can, let's put BC plus AD right there. BC plus AD is the same thing as A plus B, times C plus D minus AC minus BD. And remember, we already have AC, we already have BD. So what we're doing is we're reducing our multiplications and increasing our additions. Instead of doing four multiplications, now we're going to be doing 
three multiplications, but we're going to be doing more additions. If we do it this way, if we take a plus b, an n over two plus an n over two term, how many additions is that? That is one half alpha n additions. If we add c plus d, that is going to be one half alpha n additions. Okay, and now we need to do a subtraction, which is basically the same thing as addition, except against a negative number. A times C is a length n number. Remember, an n over two number times an n over two number is a length n number. So we have the multiplication between two length n over two numbers, which yields a length n number. Now we have a length n number added to a length n number. How many additions is that? That is going to be one alpha n additions. And now after that, we now have a length n number added to a length n number. Why is b and d, b times d, a length n number? It's a length n number because it's the product of two length n over two numbers. So a length n number added to a length n number is another one alpha n additions. So from this middle guy that we just did a little fixing to, we just did three alpha n additions. We've already done more additions than we did with our four multiplication method, four multiplications, but we reduced the amount of multiplications which was weighing us down. So now we have this result from the middle. Let's bring back our original equation. We did three alpha n additions from the middle guy and the two edge guys will just be a concatenation but what we need to think about is we're gonna be adding something length 2n to something length n. How many additions is that? That is one alpha n additions. So the total additions across the whole equation is four alpha n additions. So what we need to see is we just reduced our multiplications to three multiplications. But what we did was we increased our additions to four alpha n. And that's not a bad thing because we're going to see how that improves things. So let's analyze a recurrence for this. Okay, so let's draw a recurrence. So let's draw our equation. So now we have our equation and what we need to see is how many times do we fork? And we just established we reduced our multiplications from four to three. So we do three times. What does the subproblem break down into? Remember, we have two length n numbers. We cut them in half and we're doing the same thing. We're passing length n over two numbers, x and y, into our subproblem. So the size of the subproblem stays n over two. We break down in half. So n over two plus what? How much work do we do? at this level in terms of atomic additions. So remember, we just increased our additions and reduced our forkings. So we have four alpha n atomic additions. So this is our recurrence. And now that we have our recurrence, we can actually look at building a tree and seeing if this actually helps us. And it's just like before. Okay, so we have our original n, and what we're going to do is we're going to do three forkings. Three multiplication recursive calls happen. Okay, we broke them down into three forks, and now we have subproblem size of n over two. We've seen this before. And now we do another forking of three going downwards. Okay, and now we have all these guys right here. So let's count how many subproblems we have. Top level, we have one. This level we have three, this level we have nine. How much work is done in each level? At the top level we do four alpha n work. At the next level we do four alpha n over two work. At the next level we do four alpha n over four work. Remember that's our subproblem size passed to our addition or that our, di our additions are contingent on the subproblem size. So now do you see how we're doing powers of three? We have three to the zero, we have three to the one, we have three to the two, nine nodes, right? So we can generalize, three to the i, three to the i times four alpha what? Four alpha times n over what? We see, this is two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two. All we need to see is, we need to draw the patterns. We just need to see the patterns. It's not, it's not that difficult to see that the, the denominator is going in powers of two. And that's how we notice that. 
So what we see is we do n over two to the i. And how many atomic multiplications happen at the last level? How many levels do we have? We have log n levels. How many forkings do we do at each level? We do three forkings. So three to the log n, right? So think about this, three to the zero, three to the one, three nodes, three to the two, nine nodes. So does that make sense? So the cost of a atomic multiplication times the amount of atomic multiplications, which is gonna be three to the log n. So this is going to sink in with time, but this is what we do. We need to sum the work for the additions and we need to sum the work for the atomic multiplications. So we can do that now. So what do we do? We sum the work done in our recursion tree, which is the additions that happen, zero to the second to last level, which is technically the last level addition. The base cases are our final level, which are expressed right there. The time it takes for our atomic multiplication times the amount of atomic multiplications, which is going to be three to the log n. And this gives us the work for this algorithm. And this is called Karatsuba multiplication. I should have mentioned that in the beginning, um, but it'll be in the video title. But this gives us this equation. If we solve this, and again, it's a pretty lengthy process, we can just jump to the result. So what we see is eventually, we get a result of how many multiplic atomic multiplications? n to the log three. So, okay, we didn't, we weren't able to become faster than n log n, but we were able to achieve a, a new bound, which is a bound, which is n to the 1.58 multiplications or atomic multiplications. So is like, it's, I, I think this is just in, like intriguing. This is literally a faster way to do multiplication. This is, this is, this literally at the time it was discovered, pushed the boundaries of our understanding of how fast we could do something as simple as multiplication. And I know this video kind of is useless for this channel and is useless kind of in general to know at all. You, you won't use this probably. But anyway, to my point is, at one point, it was completely believed that the best we could do is n squared multiplications. And someone was able to figure out a way to do it faster. And the implications of this applied to other problems in life is just mind blowing. And I think that's why algorithms are fascinating. They kind of suck to learn because they're really boring and they're, they're boring. But this, this, is, this is fascinating. We were able to find, well, technically not us, but yeah, we, we, we found a faster way to multiply to a order much, much faster than n squared. Well, not much, much faster, but doing n to the 1.58 is faster than doing n squared in terms of time. This is Karatsuba multiplication, and this is fast multiplication. This is how it happens or works. All right, so normally I want to focus on algorithms like merge sort, quick sort, or algorithms you get in an interview, but I don't know what I kind of want to do. Like I want to do videos on algorithms because that's computer science, but at the same time, you don't really need to know this stuff at all for an interview. So I'm going to like slowly try to find the balance in this, but I thought this was a cool concept and there were many people confused uh, in my class and I really don't think any of this should confuse people. I think it just requires the right teaching. But anyway, if you like this video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. My goal is to build one of the world's largest software engineering resources in the next one, two, two to three years. And hopefully it happens. And another awkward outro.